let's begin. So my name is Tyrone Waldron, and um, I've been told whenever I begin a presentation, I must leave you with three words, three words with which you should remember me. And I've chosen three fantastic words. If you've ever heard a presentation from me, then there's three things or three words you'd associate with my face. You may not remember my name, but you should remember, I love cake. Did you get that? I love cake. Those are my three words. So if you see me, you don't remember my name, you, but remember, I love cake. And you should follow up your greetings with a slice of cake. My favorite, plain old vanilla sponge, nice and moist. All right? So that's me. I'm Tyrone. I'm one of the Pathfinder Area Coordinators for South of England. <clears throat> so have you had some Scottish cake then? If you really love cake, um, we'll get some Scottish cake for you. Yes, yes, I will. I will be. I will. <laughs> I will be coming to Scotland on a on a on a travel uh, journey, uh, following um, following one from the another was just presented. And yes, I would like to have some Scottish cake, please. <laughs> right now, we're going to do the red alert honor. That's you can see it in the back of me here. This is your the badge that you're going to get. Um, it's a it's a big honor. It's also a very packed honor. Um, so you've got to follow closely. Um, I think every single Pathfinder should do this honor. Why? Because it tells about various situations you could get into where people normally panic. People don't know what to do. And as a Pathfinder, people would actually look to you, especially if you're in your uniform. I tell you what, in my church, if anybody breaks down, they, they come and say, oh, uh, where's Tyrone? Tyrone, have you got a tour open your car? I say, but why should I have a tour open? Like, are you, well, you're a Pathfinder leader. I say, but Pathfinders don't drive cars. So why should I have a tour open? <laughs> just expect that I'm a Pathfinder, so I'm always prepared. And you should also become familiar with being prepared all the time, right? Now, so tell your friends, any friends that you have that isn't here today, Tell them about the Red Alert Honor. They know where to find it on the BUC website, on Facebook, on YouTube channel, and, and, and go through this honor. It's really, really important. Also, to make sure that you're paying attention, I've hidden a message within the slides. I've hidden a message in the slides. So you've got to do a bit of treasure hunting. Pay close attention. I'm not going to tell you anything else. You've got to pay close attention and see if you could figure out where my hidden messages you will need pen and paper because as the clues come up you're going to have to jot them down and eventually my hidden message should become clear all right so i'll see i see somebody getting a pen i see somebody getting a pen and a paper there so well, pay I'm close attention to remind you about that so i'm not very happy that you didn't give me the chance to remind you about the hidden message you could do it now pastor <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, there's one more thing. Um, I need you to have someone to practice with. Now, I don't want you to practice on someone smaller than you, please. Um, so if you could, if you could pull mom, pull dad, pull your big brother, pull your big sister away from whatever they're doing, you'll know when, uh, and then you can have a go if possible. And you could turn on your cameras as well so we can look and see what you're doing because we might be able to give you some pointers as to whether you're performing one or two of the operations that we're going to talk about correctly. Right? So we're going to begin. Are you ready? Thumbs up. Here we go. First question, and you should have your worksheets there with you, and we're going to basically run through all the things on the worksheet. Um, so you would follow the worksheet because I'm not going to call out numbers, but you would see it's, it's following chronologically. First question, what do you do if there's a fire in your house? What do you do if there's a fire in your house? And, and feel free to put answers in the chats, and Pastor and Nat, well, Natalie would, would, would tell me what answers you, you give. But I'm not going to wait a long time because this is a packed um, slide deck that we've got to go through. All right? 911 with 999. Those have been answers that have come through. All Call right. So 911. Let's, let's address that. Um, well, I know we have people from all over the world here. Um, in the UK, our number is 999. 999. In Europe, it's 112. If you dial 112 in, in the UK, you will also get through 
to emergency services. In fact, if you dial 911, you will also get through to emergency, but the number in the, in the UK is 999, all right? So I'm gonna give you a chance to look at a little I video. Facebook just said, I would run. <laughs> <laughs> now, now so, so, so this is gonna be a challenge because if somebody says something, I have to try to address it, otherwise, it would be left unaddressed and, and this might push our honor into a little longer than it, it is meant to, but we will slow down. If your house is on fire, do not run through the house. If you run through the house, do you know what would happen? That fire is going to come after you because you're going to have so much oxygen generated behind you as you run. That fire is going to come after you. So you've got to be very, but we, have a look at the video. Have a look at the video and see what you think. Thank you for your suggestion. If a fire happens in your home, remember, time is the biggest enemy. And every second counts. In less than 30 seconds, a small flame can get completely out of control and turn into a major fire. It only takes minutes for a house to fill with thick black smoke and become engulfed in flames. The Spokane Fire Department believes that having a sound escape plan will greatly reduce fire deaths and protect you and your family's safety if a fire occurs. Practice escape plans every month. The best plans have two ways to get out of each room. If the primary way is blocked by fire or smoke, you will need a second way out. A secondary route might be a window onto an adjacent roof or a collapsible ladder evaluated by a nationally recognized laboratory such as Underwriters Laboratories for escape from upper story windows. Make sure that windows are not stuck, screens can be taken out quickly, and that security bars can be properly opened. Also, practice feeling your way out of the house in the dark or with your eyes closed. Security bars may help to keep your family safe from intruders, but they can also trap you in a deadly fire. Windows and doors with security bars must have quick release devices to allow them to be opened immediately in an emergency. Make sure everyone in the family understands and practices how to properly operate and open locked or barred doors and windows. When a fire occurs, do not waste any time saving property. Take the safest exit route, but if you must escape through smoke, remember to crawl low under the smoke and keep your mouth covered. The smoke contains toxic gases which can disorient you or at worst overcome you. When you come to a closed door, use the back of your hand to feel the top of the door, the doorknob, and the crack between the door and the door frame to make sure that fire is not on the other side. If it feels hot, use your secondary escape route. Even if the door feels cool, open it carefully. Brace your shoulder against the door and open it slowly. If heat and smoke come in, slam the door and make sure it is securely closed, then use your alternate escape route. Designate a meeting location away from the home, but not necessarily across the street. For example, meet under a specific tree or at the end of the driveway or front sidewalk to make sure everyone has gotten out safely and no one will be hurt looking for someone who is already safe. Designate one person to go to a neighbor's home to phone the fire department. Remember to escape first, then notify the fire department by calling 911. Never go back into a burning building for any reason. Teach children not to hide from firefighters. Okay, so that's, that's taken us through um, the things that we need to do. If you, if you pay close attention, you would see that the, the two kids that were trying to escape in this drill, they went down really low and they were crawling. That's for two reasons. One, so that you don't attract the fire behind you, but also because if the house is filling up with smoke, it's hot air and the smoke is going to rise towards the ceiling, towards the roof, towards the top of the house. And if you went down low, you'd be able to avoid the smoke because smoke inhalation could cause you a lot of problems. So what do you do? You stay calm. <clears throat> the way to stay calm is by being prepared. 
having little fire drills and you would see some one of your homework in uh, number four. Number four B is to practice fire drills. You'll see that in a minute. Um, one of the ways to help you to stay calm is if you've practiced this and you know what to do, then you would do that without becoming too panicky. Um, alert others. Attempt to out the fire if it's a small fire. So if it's in the kitchen and it's a, a kitchen towel has caught a fire, then you could pick it up and take it to the sink and put it up. And, and you get your fire out. Um, if it's if it's a, if it's a big fire, like like in that video, you saw the Christmas tree, and you saw how quickly the fire became the Christmas tree became engulfed in the fire. You you don't want to try to out that fire. You want to get out the house. All right. Um, feel doors and doorknobs. Uh, don't just go to the doorknob and turn it. Um, feel the door first. If the door isn't hot, with the back of your hand, then you feel the doorknob, and if it's not hot. Then you open it, and even so, you lean your shoulder on the door in case there's going to be um, when you open the door and the, the, the air socket, uh, you allow for air to come rushing through. That could also push the fire towards you. So you lean your shoulder on the door, and if you see fire coming, then you close the door shut by leaning on it. Right? Drop and crawl. Again, do not run. Do not run. Drop and crawl along the ground. Um, escape first and then call 999. So that's what we do in a fire. We've got to keep moving. What do you do if you're stranded in a car in the desert? Right, so I give you 10 seconds to put some answers up. What do you do if you're stranded in the car in the desert? Okay, guys, what do you do? Let's. Uh... Give some answers. Um, by the way, the guys on Facebook are really following. Someone was asking, I'm not sure wh which part it was related to, but they were asking, why if my house is small? I'm not sure if it was the escape routes or something like that, but um, maybe they can clarify uh, that uh, to us. But yeah, back to the question, what do you do if you are stranded in a car in a desert? What do you guys think? Wendy says, don't wander off. It's easier to find a car than a person. Mm. Excellent. I love it. Excellent. Uh, phone for help um, is another idea. Yeah. Good. Right. Um, let's keep going. You're trapped in the desert. You've got to find shade. Now, it might be that your shade would be found by the car. So you don't stay in the car because the car is gonna become very, very, very hot. So you don't stay in the car. You gotta come out of the car, but <clears throat> if the sun is shining towards this left side of the car, then the shadow of the car is gonna fall on the right. And perhaps you sit in the shade of the car. Maybe you might have to get almost, you know, really low and close to the ground, um, almost as if below, beneath the car, but you've got to find shade. And the best place to find shade is shade pre provided by the car um if if for whatever reason maybe the sun is directly above you and you could see shade close to the car then then you get to the shade uh the car should still be inside so as as our pathfinders pointed out it's easy to find a car easier to find a car than a person so if you're in shade and you could see the car then that's good because if somebody's coming you could return to the car but you you've got to find shade um, you got to stay hydrated. You got to stay hydrated. Um, you've got water, and this this is a little bit counterintuitive, because you would think if you've got a bottle of water, um, you want to sip it, sip it, because you don't know when help is going to come. The advice is actually stay hydrated. If you've got water, you drink that water and stay hydrated. It's better you have it all in. And, and you are hydrated, then you drink some, half of the water is in the bottle and you're dehydrated and you collapse, all right? Um, don't shed your clothes. Again, this is counterintuitive because you think, oh, it's warm. You know the song says it's getting hot in here, so you take off all your clothes. No, 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 no. Do not remove your clothes. Keep your clothes on because it helps to trap your body moisture and keep you hydrated. And as our pathfinders pointed out, stay near the car. All right, stay near the car. All right, we've got to keep going. What do you do if you're stranded in a car in a blizzard, snow blizzard? 
Again, you got 10 seconds to give us some answers. What do you think? Okay, Blizzard, let's hear it, guys. What do you do uh, if you are stranded in a car in a blizzard? That we don't goes have for you guys support. as well um, on Facebook. All right, I'm going to keep going. Stay uh, warm. Stay warm. Uh, how yeah. do you suppose we stay warm? How do you, how do we stay home? How, how would we stay warm? Is no, there's something the question there's something, use a blanket? There's something that people uh, think they should do uh, and it happens very often. Uh, you're in a car, the snow has come down, you can't move. So you turn the engine on because your car has got heat in, isn't it? So you turn the engine on, you crank the heat up and you sit down in the car and you're nice and toasty. But actually, if you're stranded in a blizzard, you shouldn't run your engine all the time. Now, uh, if I go We've got back- got some more answers. Uh, stay yeah. in the car with the windows closed. Uh, these are coming from Facebook. Try to break the window and leave. Um, okay. And uh, wear a lot. Right. So some of those answers were correct. Breaking the window is not correct. <clears throat> Staying in the car, windows up, doors closed is very, very correct. Now, if you see this picture, can you see how much snow is at the top of the car? Um, and you can see how much snow is at the side of the car as well. Now, if you're in a really bad blizzard, very quickly, snow would pile up, could potentially pile up behind the car. And if that happens, then the exhaust from the car is going to be going into snow. And before long, snow would block it up. If that happens, what do you think would happen? All the fumes from the exhaust would be backed into the car. And if you're running your car constantly, if you're running the engine constantly, then you are going to fill up the cabin of the car with poisonous gases and it will overcome you, right? So if you, you stay in the car, definitely, when, uh, go back to the answers. So windows are shut, the door is closed, and, and especially at the beginning, you could run your engine 10 minutes in every hour. But do not doze off when the engine is running. If the engine is running, someone must be up, must be timing it to turn it off. And even so, if while running your engine, 10 minutes in every hour, if you begin to smell the fumes, then you turn it off and you do not run it anymore. Because it means the dangerous gases are coming into the cabin and that is going to overcome you. Uh, so you run your engine 10 minutes in every hour while you can, you keep the door shut, you keep the windows closed. Do not run <clears throat> the engine. I mentioned that already. Clear snow off the roof. So when, when the blizzard stops, I mean, you, you have an idea that the snow isn't coming down anymore. You open the door carefully and you clear snow off the top of the car, off the hood of the car, clear windows, because that would allow for, what do you think that would do? Why would you clear the snow from around the top of the car and around the windows? What do you think? What do you think, guys? This is good tips. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Um, uh, these sound tips, uh, especially for us here in Scotland. But I'm giving time for the guys online uh, on Facebook to uh, reply. Uh, don't eat snow. Okay. That's an interesting <laughs> one. Um, why are you clearing the snow be, from the window? Why should be clear the windows and the top of um, uh, the car? What do you think? Uh, people will see if there's someone inside yes. easier to spot the car. Very good. If you clear the snow, then you make the car visible. But also, also, if you clear the snow from the top of the car and the windows, if the snow has stopped falling and the sun comes out, then the sun would warm the car up and you would be more comfortable sitting inside the car. So there are two reasons. You clear it so the car could be seen, the car becomes visible, and you clear the window so that the sun could come in and warm you up on the inside. Excellent, we gotta keep going. What do you do if you are in a motor vehicle accident? What do you do if you're in a motor vehicle accident? Guys, remember I told you, people would expect Pathfinder to, Pathfinders to know what to do in all these situations. Once you put on that uniform, you see Pastor, Pastor AJ and Pastor Diane in their uniforms and, and suddenly people think they know stuff, 
when you have your uniform on, people are going to think you know stuff. So you're in an accident, you've got your uniform on, you're going to know, you're going to have to know what to do, right? So 10 seconds, give us some answers. Not Pastor AJ and Pastor Diane because they got their uniforms on and they know the answers. Oh my, I wish I knew. I'm just waiting for these guys to answer because they are brilliant. Uh, check uh, for injury, Angela yes. says. Good stuff, I like it. Let's have one more and then we continue. Okay, guys, we are waiting for you on uh, Facebook as well. We'd love to hear from you. And there's also call 911, um, maybe 999 as well in the UK, as you've already said. Exit the car. Check for damage. Okay, so let's continue. So the first answer came back was, was quite good. Is everyone okay? Now, now, the reason you're doing this is depending on how bad the accident was, um, the first thing you probably need to do is call 999. Yeah, but, but you don't want to call 999 if the only thing that was damaged is the car. Yeah, if someone is injured, someone is badly injured, that 999, you get the ambulance there as soon as possible because time would be of the essence. Time is potentially of the essence. And you could save somebody's life by getting the ambulance um, there as quickly as possible. Um, if everyone is okay, everyone is lucid, everyone is able to, to, to feel themselves and, and so on, then what you want to do is you want to stay out of the traffic. Uh, because sometimes people are distracted by an accident. They're no longer paying attention as much as they would normally. And, and they're not minding their business and somebody else coming up behind them is not. And before long, you could have another car running into your car, right? So you want to get out of the traffic. Now, now you, 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 we, we are Adventists and, and we pray, yeah? Uh, but, but if you get into a road accident, you don't come out of the car and kneel behind the car and begin to pray. Have you ever heard the joke about the, um, about the priest and the tiger? This priest was walking through the jungle one day and, and, and he saw a tiger. And the tiger saw him and the tiger liked what he saw. And um, as the tiger began to approach the priest, um, the priest dropped on all four on his knees and he began to pray. And, and then he recognized, well, it's working because the tiger hasn't bit me. So he opened one eye and he looked. And when he looked, he saw the tiger kneeling beside him. So he looked and said, well, well, what are you doing? And the tiger said, well, I'm, I'm saying my, my, my grace before meals. Right, so so that you, you don't want to get into that situation. There's a time to pray, and there is a time to action. And if you're in an accident, yes, you pray as you move, you pray as you move, but you get out of the traffic if you can. If you can move the car, I mean your parents or whoever is driving. If the car can be moved out of traffic as well to the side, then do so. If it cannot happen, then you get everyone out of the car and out of the way. And if you've got something nice and warm to wrap yourself in, depending on the temperature, then you do that as well. Um, in the UK, we've got these um, reflective triangles. Uh, you could, if there's one in the car, then the boot, then you take one and you put one. Uh, uh, at the back of the car or wherever the traffic is coming from. So people are aware in some countries they have these accident flares. So you could light this flare and put it down and people would see and know that there's been an accident. All right. Now, I hope you're taking notes. You could go to your parents and you could be very beneficial to them now. Mom, dad, have you got one of those reflective triangles in your car? If they say no, you've got to encourage them, encourage them to go to Halford's and buy themselves one of these reflective triangles. Have you have you taken a note? Pastor, are they saying yes? Are they, uh, Natalie, are they saying yes? Of course, if they, they um, Yeah, I think we can uh, forge ahead. Excellent. What do you do if you are in an earthquake? What do you do if you're in, you're in, you are in an earthquake? Right, 10 seconds. What do you do if you're in an earthquake? So let's get things going. We have guys here from Guyana, from Montserrat. Um, not that there's more earthquakes there or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it can happen anyway. But let's uh, see what the world is saying to the answers here. So we look forward to hearing from all you guys. Oh, <laughs> move to another country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Transport honor. 
<laughs> All right, I'm, I'm going to play. I'm going to play a video. For what you should do, maybe you still think a doorway is where you're supposed to go in your home, and that's not what you want to do. So how about a quick refresher course on what you should do when an earthquake hits? When an earthquake hits, you only have a few seconds to react, and how you react can save your life. I spent some time in Quakehold Industrial Shake Trailer to drive the point home. The point is to uh, kind of plant a seed in people's minds, what can happen during an earthquake, uh, what it might look like in your living room. Kate Long is with the California Emergency Management Agency. You really need to make yourself small and protect your head and neck, get under something if you can, get next to something sturdy if you can't get under something. You're really trying to protect yourself from the stuff inside your house. As you can see, that's, that was really strong shaking, and that shaking could last a long time in a real earthquake, and we wouldn't be able to move or run. There is a time to run, A, and mm -hmm. B, at the same time, even if you could run, the ground is moving, so your traction is off. And there's all kinds of debris that's fallen off of your shelves, and people slip on that, and that's another reason people injure themselves. It's very unlikely that your house will collapse. But what if there is something heavy overhead? If I'm right next to something that I think is dangerous, like let's say I have grandma's china on the top shelf, I'm going to try to move, but I'm going to try to move from my low position. I might not be able to move. Okay. I might be able to, but I got to do it low because if I try to stand up and move, that's where the danger comes. That's right. And if you, even if it's just the leg of your sofa or something, grab onto that and, and protect your. And that's because things are going to keep moving. If you go under a table and don't hold on, the table might move out away from you. Long says Californians may have a false sense of security since the small earthquakes we usually experience. Right. Um, I'm not going to play the whole video. There's more there, but we're already a little behind my schedule. So um, important things. This is not the information that I was taught 15 years ago. I was actually thought, I was actually taught you, you've got to go and stand in a doorway. Have you heard that as well? Stand in a doorway because a doorway is the strongest part of the house. But you know what? I've seen houses being built in the UK and they built very differently from the way they built in Trinidad. In Trinidad, they build houses with um, doorways made of steel. Here, they put bricks and across the top, they put a beam. Now, if those bricks begin to shake and they fall out and you're standing below this doorway, you're gonna have the weight of a beam um, uh, crashing through uh, a wooden frame and coming down on you. But as this video has pointed out, even more importantly, an earthquake comes on you so quickly that you don't really have time to get up and move. You've got to drop low, protect your head. Did you notice every time the lady said drop low, she immediately put her hand over her head? Even when she mentioned about grandma's china, she said, um, I'm going to try to move, but she put her hand on her head, right? Always protect your head. Um, if, if you can exit the building, if it's still light, it hasn't started, um, the tremor hasn't gotten too, too big, you exit the building. Um, if you're outside, you stay away from buildings and power lines. Beware of aftershocks. Now, aftershocks are subsequent, usually smaller earthquakes that follow. Um, but sometimes, because damage has already been done by the main tremor, the aftershock is all you need to finish bringing a building down. Um, so if an earthquake has happened, you've got to remember the aftershock. You've got to make sure that the building has been checked and it's safe uh, to return to, et cetera. Um, aftershocks could be days after, or even weeks after. Um, call 999 for serious problems. Now, this is important. If there's an earthquake, then an earthquake doesn't happen in a small area. The earthquake is going to happen in a relatively large area. And if everyone who felt the shaking called 999, then we'll have a problem. So after an earthquake, you're only going to call 999 if there's a serious problem. Maybe you've seen um, an electricity line that is broken or gas lines broken or water mains are broken and it's causing floods because those are the things that could cause problems after the earthquake. Or of course, someone's trapped and injured, then you call 999. Right. Am I okay to continue? Are there any questions coming in there? No, let's, so let's keep going. This is a big one, guys. What do you do if you are in a flood? And we've been having, as you look at the news, floods everywhere. There are floods everywhere of late. What do you do 
if you're caught in a flood. Let's give 10 seconds. What do you do if you are caught in a flood? Let's uh, try and see what the best course of action here is. Get to higher ground. Good, I like it. Get to the highest place. Yeah. Um, One more. And for those guys who are joining us um, on Facebook, uh, go higher. So that's generally uh, the idea. Uh, close the window, say somebody else. All right, okay. Okay. Um, if you're inside, um, you want to disconnect appliances. All right, because you know water is a conductor for electricity, right? So you don't want any appliance falling into water in the house, and then you're standing in the water and you're becoming electrocuted or getting electrocuted. So you disconnect appliances. If you could get to the mains, you turn off the power at the mains. All right. Um, fill your bathtub with water is one suggestion. Why do you think that is? Fill your bathtub with water. Fill your bathtub with water. I nearly answered that, but um, let's wait on and hear what these guys have to say, because my idea is probably wrong. Go on, Pastor. Um, let's hear your idea. The ghost um, I'm scared now. <laughs> 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 okay, we're gonna keep going. So the reason you're gonna fill your bathtub is your bathtub is probably the biggest thing you have in your house that could hold water. And with a flood, often your reservoirs get contaminated. Um, I've, I've witnessed floods in Trinidad before I came to the UK many years ago. And you turn on the taps after and everything coming out of the tap is brown. So, so you might end up having only the water in your bathtub to do everything that you need to do for a little while. Um, you might even have to use that water to cook. You put it on the fire, you heat it up, boil it first, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be a lot better than using the brown water that might be coming out of your taps after a flood. Actually, that's what the guys, uh, we have, um, we are on Facebook saying to have clean water um, for the next uh, few days. That's and right. yeah. nothing when, like uh, when the consuming lessons. Out. <laughs> no swimming lessons from the from some of us would have thought. Uh, yeah, Natalie, you were saying something. Yeah, just to say, Wendy also said the same thing because it's clean water and it may be, uh, you know, the nearest thing to drinkable water you've got. That's right. That's Not right. You have swimming lessons. Okay. Back to you. Well, don't cross flooded streams. Yeah. You don't know how deep it is. It, it, yes, you're accustomed passing there, but water is very powerful and water might have eroded um, the concrete um, base that is probably normally there. Uh, anything could happen. Anything could be happening below the water and it could be quite strong as well. Um, if you're caught in water, now this is really important. This is something we never want to have happen to us. But if you were to be caught in flooded water that's moving, um, quickly, then you want to try to turn onto your backs and float. Some swimming lessons would be, would be, um, would be helpful. Uh, <laughs> if, you've, if you've done your friend curriculum, then you would have done um, beginner swimming and in your companion, most likely you would have done advanced beginner swimming. Um, so you get onto your back and you try to float. Now also, you make sure that your feet are facing the direction the water is pulling you, all right? So, if even if you fell into the water and your head was going first, you've got to try to get your body turned around so that your feet are facing the direction in which the water is pulling you. Why? If there's some obstacle in your way and you go crashing into it, your feet would be able to absorb the impact because as your feet touch, your knees are going to bend and your hips are going to flex and that's going to make it easier for you to hit into that um, object. If your head was to hit the object, there is no cushion, there is no flexing, there is no absorption. You're going to hit your head and you're going to likely damage yourself and then you won't be able to float anymore. So you, you, you feet first, really, really important. Again, this is something we hope never happens to any of us here, but if it did, feet first, float on your back. Do not try to stand in water. Um, the reason you don't want to try to stand in fast moving water is, is, is quite simple. If you stand trying to walk and something traps your feet, then the force of the water coming towards you will knock you over. 
you will then be unable to stand because, because your feet are trapped and you can't move it. And you would have to try to raise your torso up but with the force of the water pushing you down, you would find it impossible to get up again, right? So you keep your feet up in the air, out of the water, toes out of the water, you avoid getting tangled and um, use your hands if you can to help you float and to help you sort of pull the water and, and get you moving towards the, the bank or the edge where you could potentially climb out. <clears throat> this is really important, I'll, I'll give, 10 seconds in case there are any questions. Is that clear? Okay, so we're moving along. Oh boy. Um, what do you do in a tornado? Um, I'm going to go straight into it. What do you do in a tornado? Tornadoes aren't very common in the UK, uh, fortunately. Um, you go to a basement or shelter. Again, basements aren't very common in the UK, possibly partly because we don't have tornadoes as much as some places. Um, but you go to a basement or a storm shelter, if you can, if, you, if there's sufficient warning. Um, you go, if you can't, and you, you're in a house or a building, then, and it doesn't have a basement, you go to the lowest floor you can, right? Go to the lowest floor. You stay in a room, possibly with no, no windows. Um, you try to get to the middle of the house, wherever is the middle of the house, away from windows, away from doors, that's your best place. And if possible, if you could get a mattress or a thick blanket and you try to protect yourself, possibly even cover over yourself with, with a thick blanket or, or mattress, then if your windows were to be broken by the tornado, uh, some of the obstacles that would be flying and whirling around um, would potentially hit the mattress rather than hitting you causing injury to yourself. All right? Um, hurricane, what do you do if you're in a hurricane? Again, we do feel the effects of hurricanes, but we, we don't have hurricanes here as in the Caribbean, where I'm originally from. from. Um, so again, what do you do? Hurricane. I'm going to tell you this one. You put shutters up. So these are pieces of wood, plyboard, that you go and you, you sort of nail around all your windows. Um, again, to prevent things flying in and breaking your windows. Um, evacuate if you advise to do so. There are lots of people who say, well, I love my house and, and, and um, um, I don't want to leave my house. And you've got all sorts of excuses for not leaving when, when advised to do so. But if the advice is to evacuate, then your best course of action probably is to evacuate. Um, Move the higher ground. This was also an answer we got to in floods. Yes, again, if it's possible, you do so. Look out for storm surge. Now, a storm surge is a scenario where the the sea, the the um the sea level rises, sometimes 12, sometimes dozens of feet above where it normally is. So normally the wave would break and it just reaches the shoreline with a surge then you could have water reaching far inland, much further than it would normally reach. Uh, so you've got to be careful uh, looking out for those as well. Have non-perishable food and water. Now, this is really important. And this is, this is good practice in general, to have non-perishable food and water. Even if we don't have uh, hurricanes, there's all sorts of disasters that could happen. Um, it's a good idea. So again, something for you to pick up with mom, mom, dad. Do you have an emergency kit, an emergency stash of stuff, some water, some food, some hand sanitizer, some face masks? Uh, you see where I'm going with this. Um, and you have it there. I used to do this in my car. I had a, a chocolate digestive biscuit in my car. That was my emergency ration until I, I recognized I knew it was there. And every time I felt packaged, I would have it faster. <laughs> so I'll have it now. I don't have it. <laughs> I don't have it now. But it's a good idea to have some... Um, some non-perishable food and water, emergency kit, a little emergency ration kit. Um, again, fill your bathtub, you know why. Uh, fill your car with fuel, yeah, because you never know what would happen after the storm and, and you may not be able to get fuel for a while. Turn off electricity, again, for the same reasons as we gave during a flood. Right, moving along, this one is more common in the UK. What do you do if you're in a thunderstorm? Uh -huh. Let me give you a minute. Ah, oh, no, sorry, sorry, not a minute. Let me give you 10 seconds. Uh, 10 seconds for some answers. What do you do 
if you're caught in a thunderstorm. Okay, guys, let's uh, let's answer that. What do you do if you are caught in a thunderstorm? Uh, open um, some water and put it in a bath. Okay, get low. Uh, lay flat on the ground. Uh, turn off all electronics and turn on the radio. Uh, stay in your car with uh, rubber tires. I've got all the answers there. I love it. Now I have to pick up on one. One person said lie on the ground. Um, you do not lie on the ground. Right. Um, anybody wants to tell anybody wants to say why you do not lie on the ground? Five seconds. Right, I'll tell you in a um, minute. Don't okay, okay. Uh well this I guess was the Step one. Gauge the danger. If you can hear thunder, you're within striking distance of lightning. Most lightning deaths and injuries occur in the summer. Step two, seek shelter in a fully enclosed building. Open structures are not safe. Once inside, stay off electronics and corded phones and away from plumbing. Lightning can travel through wires and plumbing. Remain indoors until 30 minutes after the thunder ends. Step three, if there is no enclosed building nearby but you have access to a car, get inside it, roll up the windows, and stay off electronic equipment. Step four, if you're stuck in an open space, crouch down on the balls of your feet, feet together, to minimize your contact with the ground. Put right, that's why you don't lie on the ground. Because if you lie on the ground, you become too big. You become a big target on the ground. Did you see the way he was crunching on his toes? Some places say go on your knees, but you go into a bowl as make yourself as small as you can. If you lie on the ground, you're not very small at all. All right, really, really important. Your hands over your ears to protect yourself from acoustic shock, which can damage hearing. If you are with a group, leave at least 20 feet between each person to decrease the risk of more than one person getting struck. Step five, don't take a boat out on the water if a thunderstorm is predicted. Okay, we, we got the important bit here already. Um, we have two deaths in the UK each year from lightning strikes. And of course, lightning strikes uh, part of a thunderstorm. We have 30 yearly injuries in the UK, right? So this is, it's, it's, it's low, but as pathfinders, we're outside a lot, isn't it? We're outside a lot. So it's important that we know this. Again, remember I said, tell all your pathfinder friends they need to do the red alert honor, right? No showers or baths. Did you see in that video, we heard one of the pathfinders said, you turn off your electricity, good. But the, electri uh, the, the electricity could all from the lightning could also travel through the plumbing. Did you see that? Yeah. So you don't want to be in your shower. You don't want to be having a bath. You hear thunder. You turn off the shower and you sit in the middle of the room away from the windows. You could shower later. Yeah. It's not the end of the world. Do not use landline phones. Well, we don't do that anymore anyway, do we? Anybody knows what a landline phone is? <laughs> do not lie on the ground we covered that um get inside a building or a car i was really impressed that someone said get into a car with rubber tires very good um uh and stay away from trees i i i was i was taught that i shouldn't be the tallest thing so i always thought it'd be good to go and stand next to a tree and apparently that's a no-no a lot of people in the u.s so in the u.s there are 58 people that die from lightning strikes per year. On an average, the UK is only two. And a lot of those people who die were close to trees, believe it or not. So you stay away from trees. You stay away from trees. Right. We got to keep going. This one we wouldn't stay long on. Um, what do you do uh, in an atomic emergency? Evacuate. Right? You, you can't outrun this one. You've got to evacuate if you can. If you can't, you get underground if possible. If you can't, then it's a good idea again, forward planning um, to, to have potassium iodine tablets, right? Uh, this would help to, to fight against the radiation from, uh, from a nuclear blast. Uh, cover your ears, your mouth, your eyes, and your nose with cloth. This is to help protect against particles from the blast as well, uh, the alpha particle in the main. I'm, I'm speeding over this one because um, it is perhaps one of the, the, there's not much we could do and it's, it's not so likely for us here uh, in the UK. 
I say that although there's a, a nuclear plant being built um, half an hour away from my house at the moment. Okay. <laughs> right. What do you do in an avalanche? Let's give five seconds. What do you do in an avalanche? So let's get typing and um, chat out the answers, guys. Um, all right, uh, try and find a cave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stay low. <laughs> right, let me help you here. So, so you've, got, you've got a rock avalanche or a snow avalanche? Um, you want to curl into a tight ball, right? So you curl into a tight ball, always protect your head, yeah? You curl into a tight ball, try to cover your head as best you can. You want to have your face downhill. So if the avalanche is coming from up here, then your face should be pointing down this way. You want to put your back against where the avalanche is coming from so that the part of you that would be struck would be your back, all right? Um, so you, you crouch into a tight ball, keep yourself as tight as possible, and you cover your head with your back towards the avalanche and you're facing forward, um, face downhill. Always cover your head, always protect your head. Um, uh, always carry a radio beacon. Now this is for snow avalanche. So, so the advice is you shouldn't be traveling through um, avalanche country. So areas where it's known to have snow avalanche, you want to avoid it. But if for whatever reason you must be there, then you should always have a radio beacon. Um, this radio beacon is, is, is a little gadget that gives out a, a GPS signal. Beep, beep. So if you were stuck, if you were trapped and rescuers came, then they would follow your beacon to find you. Um, and this has to happen very quickly because after an avalanche, the snow compacts and becomes really hard. Um, it would be impossible to clear yourself from the aftermath of an avalanche with your hands after just a few minutes. Um, so you always carry a shovel. If you're going through avalanche country, you always carry a shovel. And this radio beacon shouldn't be one in a group. Every member of a group should have one of these beacons. All right, we'll do this one quickly as well. Um, what do you do if your boat or canoe capsizes? Um, so this is a short video, so I'll, I'll play the beginning of it so you see how to recover yourself. The Capistrano Flip is a more advanced rescue that you can do without the help of another boat, although it's a lot easier if you're using a lightweight canoe because it requires that you lift the canoe completely out of the water. You'll start by positioning yourself and your partner, if you have one, beneath the overturned canoe and you'll grab both gunnels. If there are two of you, you'll position yourself at opposite ends facing each other. You'll then lift one gunnel out of the water to break any suction and with a strong scissor kick, you'll heave the gunnel up into the air and flip the canoe upright. Getting back into the upright canoe without any help can be the biggest challenge. If you're a solo paddler, you'll want to approach the canoe around the midpoint. As a pair, you'll grab opposite sides of the canoe as close to the midpoint as possible without getting in each other's way. In both cases... Okay, what, what you also want to, to do is if you can't flip your boat or your canoe back right side up, then you want to stay with it. Uh, just like with your car, you want to stay with it. Um, don't look and say, hmm, it looks like I could swim there in five minutes. If you think you could swim there in five minutes, it's probably too far away for you to try to swim. Um, so you wanna stay with your canoe again. Uh, you're gonna be spotted very easily. It's easier to see somebody, sorry, to see a canoe than, or a boat than to see somebody swimming away in, in the water. All right. <laughs> Telephone call in an emergency what information should be given. We, we'll whisk through this because I think this is almost very common knowledge. So you're gonna give your name, you've got to give your name and your number, first things, because if you get disconnected, you want to have the emergency people, um, you wanna give them the opportunity to call you back, all right? This is one of the reasons why you don't make prank calls or dial 999 in accident, in, by accident, because once a call comes in, they will try to reach you again. 
and you will be clogging up the lines for people who really have an emergency. So yeah, as soon as you call, you give your name, you give your number. Then you tell them the location of the emergency, nature of the emergency. You tell them if there were dangers or if there were injuries, injuries that occurred, and you do not hang up the call till the responder is hung up. All right. This is this is relatively common knowledge. If you need it for your notes, it's there. Um, so we're going to move on quickly. The next one I think is also pretty common knowledge. Um, what first aid do you do? What first aid do you need if someone's clothes is on fire? I think this is very common. So pastor, shall we have the answers from the chat? What do you do? What first aid do you need if someone's clothes is caught on fire? Okay, let's uh, smother the flames. So quick straight up and tell them to stop, drop and roll. There we go, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm not gonna wait any longer. It's very easy, stop, drop and roll. In this picture, this person is running. And again, he is feeling this flame. He is feeling, do you, do you remember when we go camping and you, and you begin to light your fire? When we want that fire to grow, what do we do? We fan it, isn't it? We get a piece of cardboard and we fan it. When he runs, he is effectively fanning himself. And he is, he is, he is feeding that flame. You stop, drop on the ground, and you roll and roll and do not stop rolling until you feel that relief. All right, good. You expect it, oops. Um, so <laughs> uh, what's gonna come up next is it's gonna look a little bit um, gory, but I promise you it's not. It's actually fake. It's all paint. It's all paint. If you're afraid of blood, then put your hands over your eyes and look gently, look gently. It's not real. It is not real, I promise you. There we go. Can you see the fake blood kicks? This is all me. This is the stuff that they make and um, they put in the movies. Um, what first aid do you need if someone's got a severe bleeding wound? All right. Now, I've got a video, but I'm not going to play the video. Uh, it's here, so you could look at it on the um, on the website. Uh, the important thing when there is a severe bleeding wound is you try to get your hands clean, sanitize your hands, wash your hands. You get clean cloth, gauze, or whatever you can, but it should be clean. And you cover the wound and you apply pressure. The way to stop bleeding is to cover the wound and apply pressure. You apply pressure. It could be if it's a very, a wound, if this wound in this picture, if it were real, then you would probably need to be applying pressure to that wound for about 10 minutes before the bleeding really stops, right? So you cover that wound and you apply pressure. The video would go into more details, but this is the gist, this is the important thing. Clean hands, clean cloth, clean piece of gauze, cover the wound, apply pressure. You could use a bandage to wrap it really tight to help you apply that pressure. Right, now this one is important. Um, I've got 10 more minutes, nine minutes even, and we've got 10 slides to go through, but these ones are important, so I'm gonna have to, we have in the UK an average 351 deaths a year from choking. So this is important. 351 is a lot, right? What do you do? Um, what, sorry, what first aid do you need if someone's choking? I have to play this video. So look carefully, look closely, get your, get your partner now. Remember I told you at the beginning, you need to practice on somebody. If you can turn your cameras on, do so, get that person around now. This is where you want to practice, right? So have a look, look carefully, look closely. Gabby, are you all right? Are you choking? Here, lift up your elbows. I'm going to push on your stomach, okay? Oh, are you okay? Can you breathe now? Oh, man, that was close. <coughs> now let's break down the skills for child-conscious choking. 
When we approach a choking child, there's a couple things we want to do to evaluate whether or not they're truly choking or not. One is ask them if they're choking. If they're able to respond to you verbally, they may have something stuck, but it's probably not in the airway, or at least it's not fully obstructed because they're actually able to move enough air past their larynx to be able to formulate a word. But if they're able to only nod or kind of that gagging, high-pitched squeaking noise, chances are there's an obstruction and it's fully occluding their airway. Another universal sign, if they've been trained to do so, or sometimes even naturally, is for them to grasp around their throat as if they are choking. It's at that point I'm gonna say, are you all right, are you choking? They nod yes, they have the universal sign with their hands around their throat. I'm then going to instruct the child to lift their elbows up as I lower myself to their level. The reason we wanna to get to the level of the size of the child is so that we don't put unnecessary pressure on their rib cage. We'd rather not break any ribs or cause any further harm if at all possible. It's at that point that we wanna find an important landmark. We're gonna find the belly button. Once we find the belly button, we're gonna ball up the other fist with our thumb tucked in and place that tucked in thumb against their abdomen just above the belly button. Then we grab that fist hand and go inward and upward into their diaphragm. We're gonna do that inward and upward thrust as many times as it requires until the object actually comes out. They're able to breathe and Okay. Now, I want you to do something for me before you try that. I want you to cough, a nice, long, big cough like this. <laughs> Just one cough, not, not <laughs> one big cough. <laughs> try it. Do you feel what your tummy feels like? Do you feel what your stomach feels like? Do you feel how your stomach is contracting? <laughs> now, when you do this abdom abdominal thrust, previously known as the Heimlich Maneuver, that's what you're trying to simulate, yeah? So, so as you practice it, I give you 10 seconds. I don't know uh, if you're able to, if you have people there. So you, you make that fist and you, you put that fist just above the belly button or navel. You grab your other arm, grab the fist with your other arm and you pull in and up, in and up. And you wanna do that five quick times. Five, all right? Okay, is there something else you can do? Yes. Uh, in fact, over the years, I've done a lot of first aid courses because I'm a pathfinder. Um, and it's funny, the information given on choking changes relatively often. Um, so I spent some time in preparation for this honor. And what is now being said is you should do five and five. Five and five what? So. The other thing is called back blows or back slaps. And you can see it in this picture here. You could also see it in this picture here, all right? Um, you, you get the person to crouch over, you support them with your weaker hand and your stronger hand, you use the palm or the heel of your hand. And between their shoulder blades, in the middle of their back, you hit again five times. Hard, but now, now if you practice it now, you do. Please do not practice hard. Just try to get that motion and do not do it on anyone smaller than you, someone your size or bigger. All right. Uh, and in the middle there, so bam, bam. you need to be cautious on this one and all the things in, in all the five actually. The five and the five just call for caution. I see someone here is saying, My brother sounds like he's dying, I'm sure. There's no harm happening there. Uh, his death was the cough. Uh, but uh, please make sure uh, that you are safe as you try some of these things. Yeah. Now, now, that's a very good point. Um, if you could cough, there is no, if the person who seems to be choking could cough, you do not need to do the abdominal thrust. You also do not need to give back blows. If you're coughing, it means your, your body is able to do what the abdominal thrust tries to simulate. So if somebody is coughing, be there so that you could, you could support, you can you, you assure them they're going to be okay, encourage them. If they stop coughing, that means all the air is, is cut off. They would also not be able to talk. That's when you're going to do five blows to the back, middle between the, the, the shoulder board. One, two, three, four, five. You see if they recover. If they can't, then you go 
to five abdominal thrusts as described previously. So it's cough it out, slap it out, squeeze it out. That's what you're gonna remember. Everybody type that into the chat. Cough it out, slap it out, squeeze it out. Cough it out, slap it out, squeeze it out. I think this one is important. Um, we, we're almost out of time now, two more minutes. Um, and here I have a picture and some instructions that could be used for performing abdomen, abdominal thrust on yourself as well. Uh, you could choke in a place where there's no one around. Um, so I'll leave that there so you could see as well. Remember, that's the universal international uh, sign for I'm choking, help, I'm choking. Again, I'm not gonna play this next video. Um, or maybe I'll play this one. Uh, what do you do if you uh, if you see someone uh, who's been poisoned? Okay, so. YouTube have decided we won't play that one. <clears throat> um, so uh, very quickly, you're gonna look for um, a bottle, see if there's any bottles around. You're gonna look for, look at their skin to see if you see redness. You're gonna look at their lips and their mouth to see if it seems burned. Um, if you see any any of these signs, if, if it's on their clothes, you're gonna try to remove the clothes that might be, um, poisoned, you're gonna wash the area, flood the area with lots and lots of clean water. If it's in their mouth, you give them um, the water to wash and drink as well. Um, if they vomit, if they vomit, you're gonna contain the, the what is given out and keep it so that you could give it to the emergency, um, the, the, the ambulance when they come. Um, but you do not try to get them to vomit. Um, and and you just try to reassure them. So you keep the areas clean. If you see what might have poisoned them, then you try to collect it safely. And again, you give this to the um, ambulance when it would arrive. Of course, you call 999. Um, and if they become unresponsive, then you would have to do CPR. That's not covered in this uh, honor. All right, um, right, we've got one more minute. This is your homework. Uh, where is it? This is your homework. This is, you have to do this in order to complete this honor. You must draw an escape route for your family and you must practice your family's fire drill. Uh, again, the next video, which I will not play now, is a video that shows you how to prepare a fire escape route and how to um, practice a fire drill. So all the answers are there. So you would have to do that. On. Tyrone, just to um, just to let people know if they're worried about missing out on the videos, that I think if you can send me the links, then we can put those up on the website, so nobody needs to worry about missing out on anything. Okay. Um, because I know time has been short this afternoon, but this is such an important honour. Um, we don't want anyone to miss out on anything. So if we could send us the links, then we can um, put those on, and people can look at it in your in their own time. Yeah, and if, if, if it's possible to put the, the whole presentation on the website as well, then it's all in there. Oh, oh yeah, that will definitely go on as yeah. well, for sure. Yeah. Okay, how, uh, last minute, how to get people out of a burning building. Now we've touched on some of it already, but this is what you need to do. Have an evacuation plan in place. If you don't have an evacuation plan, and you haven't practiced an evacuation plan, it would be very difficult to keep people calm and panic is the biggest problem to deal with in, in emergency situations like these, all right? So you've got to have an evacuation plan. You've got to practice your evacuation plan. If you're in school now and you've been in that school for two years and you've never done a fire drill, when you go to school next, you need to go to the head office, the head teacher's office and say, um, sir, ma'am, I noticed we have not had a fire drill. Can we have a fire drill, please? Lives depend on this. Um, remain calm. Think I know what to do. And you could only know or think I know what to do if you've practiced. Touch those panicking on the shoulder and tell them what they need to do. 
if they don't respond and they seem to still be fluttered and, and flustered and, and panicky, then shout at them and tell them what to do. That would get their attention and get them moving. Get people to calmly walk out of the building. Calmly walk out of the building. Or if the fire is already going, calmly crawl out of the building. Um, you've got to be aware of a stampede. People have died trying to rush out of dangerous situations. Uh, they get to a doorway and it's a bottleneck and they're trying to squeeze through. Ultimately, someone falls and then people end up walking and climbing on top of someone who is not able to get up because every time someone steps off, someone else steps on them. And, and that is very, very, very dangerous. Um, so beware of a stampede. And the final slide is how to prevent abduction. Parents should always know where their kids are. Never leave children alone in cars. This seems like common sense, doesn't it? But you would be surprised. Create a family code word. So it means you sit with your kids and you choose a word that only you know and that your children would remember or child would remember. Get them to learn that word and get them to know. I will never send someone to take you from where you are without you knowing that they're coming for you unless I give them the code word. So if Pastor AJ comes and says, mommy says to come with me, say, what's the password, pastor? What's the code word? And if he doesn't know, then you say, pastor, I'm sorry. I know you're a man of God, but mommy says, I do not go anywhere with anyone unless I have, then Pastor AJ would get his phone. He would call, oh, you didn't give me the, the and, then, and then he gets the code word and he gives the code word and then you go, you happily leave and go with pastor. Of course, that code word shouldn't be shared with anyone. It should be kept your family's top secret. Have kids fingerprint taken. Might seem a little bit extreme, but um, if you can, do so. Um, keep current photos of your kids. Keep a mental image. This is all for parents. Keep a mental image of what your kid, your children, your child left home wearing that day. All right? Um, GPS apps can be useful. I use Live 360 with my family. <laughs> now, it's been fine all along. Now, now I've got teenage kids and they try to find all sorts of ways to beat it because of course they want to um, they wanna, they wanna do stuff that uh, parents should know about, isn't it? But this could be quite useful as well. Um, and if by chance you've been abducted, someone is trying to abduct you, then you scream, you scream. But what do you scream? You scream fire, top of your voice. Don't scream help because people have gotten too used to help. Uh, people, uh, they look over and they say, oh, he's playing. But you scream fire and everybody stops and everybody looks. So the top of your voice, pull your diaphragm, fire, as loud as you can. And that would get a, attention. After fire, he is not my father. This is not my parent, help. And that's, that's going to do the trick. Right. Um, that's it, Pastor. We're at the end. I started uh, 10 minutes late and I've gone five minutes extra, <laughs> uh, uh, four minutes extra. So, uh, sorry, this, this is a big honor. This is a really, really big honor. I, I've, I've, I've glazed over the bits I don't think are very important and we spent a little bit more time on the things I think to be very important, but do tell your friends the honor is on the internet, the honor is on the BC page, Get folks to do this honor. All your pathfinders should do this honor. Ah, did anybody figure out the code? Did anybody find the hidden message? Well, I'm not going to tell you. If you haven't found it, you're going to have to do the honor. <laughs> well, well, well. We are just getting a lot of uh, people responding. Uh, good tips and appreciation. And uh, thank you for, uh, as you are saying, this is a very important uh, honor. And uh, there's uh, so much we wish all the club leaders will take this uh, and take notice of this. But Hewo has found the code. So do you want uh, them to just say to everyone? Yeah, go on. Tell us. Tell us what they found. Okay. So you want to type that in, Hewo? What? Okay. Uh, uh, what could we do if we are adapted? 
that's probably just a question that's been brought. Um, I think the slide here that's still showing is uh, abduction prevention. So you want to go there uh, for answer, uh, finding the answer. The code is AWA. Um, not sure what is that the code AWA? No, no, no. So 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 AWA is part of the slide. message. That's part of the message on the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Hewo, you said you found the code. Um, Somebody else is putting down always protect your head. Is there that... we go? That's it. Always Galaxy S9 well Hunts Point Pathfinders. Well done to you. I think you were the first ones to get that. Excellent. That's the that's the hidden code. That's the hidden message. Always protect your head. Always protect your head. So you're in an earthquake, you're in an avalanche, you are trapped in, in fast raging moving waters, you always protect your head. And we discussed that a lot. And I did say it a few times, didn't I? Always protect your head. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this. I hope you find it beneficial. I hope you feel aware. Um, and and if, you, if you go traveling, because you just did the travel honor, Actually, some of the things I glaze over, like a tornado, might become quite important. Mm. Right? So, mm. Godspeed, and see you next time. Oh, we want to express our appreciation to Tyron. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.